he thought my vocation was done with. It was, you know, part of my life that was over. Uh, but it wasn't. God had other plans too that I, I couldn't see at the time. And, and my wife was meant to play a very, very important role in that vocation. You know, some people ask me, well, you know, what kind of seminarian are you? <laughs> well, you know, one, I'm not your traditional one because, first of all, I'm older than most seminarians. I've got a good 30 years on most of these seminarians. Um, uh, one time I was talking to the youngest seminarian in our, the youngest deacon that we have in our class, and he was going, oh, you're older than my mom and dad. I was like, oh, thank you very much. But we have the same calling, so it's, um, we're answering the same call to serve. And I think in, in that respect, we're, we're all in the same boat. We're going to be ordained at the same time, and we're going to start our ministry at the same time. So as a seminarian, it is something that binds us together. One thing that I remember uh, that I always have in mind, and I can never keep it out of my mind, is the fact that I was a seminarian when I was a teenager, at 15, 15, 16, 17, in, back in the Philippines. It's now, it wasn't even in this country. So I had that experience uh, that, there, that they have as a young seminarian. And then I was a seminarian again in my early, early 20s, um, late teens and early 20s, when I joined um, um, the Franciscans, the Capuchin Franciscans in New York City, when I was, uh, after I emigrated to the United States. They gave, I put out my uh, ordination card, and there's a picture, uh, it's uh, out there, in fact. There's a picture of a crucifix. Uh, it's, a, it's a life-size crucifix, and it's a crucifix from my high school in the Philippines, the Minor Basilica of St. Sebastian. And when I was 15, I was drawn to prayer at this beautiful church where uh, my high school was. It's an old Gothic uh, uh, minor basilica. And I always prayed in front of that uh, crucifix. I would kneel down in front of that crucifix. One night, when I went to bed and I had a dream, and it was, the dream was I was kneeling in front of that crucifix. And that crucifix was talking to me in my dream, but I couldn't hear what it was saying. It didn't have any sound. I saw the mouth of the of Jesus moving on the, cro on the crucifix, but I, I couldn't make out what it was saying. Um, and that was very, very, you know, a very striking uh, dream for me, and I always remembered, and I'll never forget it. And this is why I put that crucifix on my ordination card. But it was the very, very beginning of me, you know, that I can remember of me thinking God is calling me to do something. 15 years old. I was with the Salesians for three years in the Philippines, including two years of college seminary. And then I emigrated to the United States and I ended up in New York City. And uh, I went to undergrad at St. John's University in New York City. And um, I joined the Capuchin Franciscans in New York City because that was, that was my original love anyway, St. Francis of Assisi. And then after three years, after I graduated from St. John's University with my degree in communications and journalism, I, I actually discerned out why, I have no idea, I can't even remember why I discerned out. Uh, it wasn't because of a loss of love for God, uh, that wasn't it at all. But for some reason I discerned out and, uh, and um, I lived in New York City and worked there and after a few years of uh, working in New York City, I met my future wife, Ray. Ray is actually my connection to Des Moines because uh, even though I met her in New York City, she was born and raised in the south side of Des Moines, Iowa. And uh, yeah, um, after I got married, it's almost like uh, after you get married, you go, well, that's it for my vocation, right? It's out the window. I'm gonna put that to sleep. But you know what, God, works in very, very strange ways. I thought my vocation was done with. It was, a, you know, part of my life that was over. Uh, but it wasn't. God had other plans, too, that I, I couldn't see at the time. And, and my wife was meant to play a very, very important role in that vocation. 
You see, after, after I graduated from college, I was teaching ballroom dance. Go figure. First, I drove a, a New York City taxi uh, and, and then at, uh, during the day, and then at night, I was teaching ballroom dance. And while ballroom dance, you're gonna meet a lot of girls doing ballroom dance. So I, I, I did, I started dating. Uh, and that's, in fact, that's how I met my wife, was uh, she applied for a job where I was teaching ballroom dance. And uh, I was training her to become uh, one of the teachers and we started dating. Uh, all of a sudden, the, um, the idea of becoming a priest um, got put in the back burner or I couldn't even see it. Um, but you know what? When I, whenever I think about that, it didn't really go away. It was almost like somebody turned down the volume of God's call. Maybe it was actually God that turned down the volume of his call um, because he had something that I wanted, that he wanted me to go through before he would call me back. Uh, and uh, when he turned it, when they turned the volume down, I, you know, I, the other volume went up and that is, you know, becoming, becoming a husband. She was funny, she was engaging, she was, uh, you know, I, she was 21 when I met her, and uh, I was 24, 25. So at that age, you kind of like life is, life is your shell, you know. All of our plans were travel. We traveled a lot together in Europe. Um, that was our thing, was we backed back through Europe uh, every summer. You know, once the moment I got my my tax refund from the IRS, boom, uh, buy the plane tickets and we were off to Europe every summer. We would just go backpacking through Italy. Italy was our country. And uh, she and I just, we were travel mates and we, it brought us closer and closer together. Uh, and then having converted to Catholicism, Italy was full of churches for her to kind of immerse herself in with her curiosity about the Catholic faith. And I was there to kind of be her commentator about the uh, Catholic faith. So it was, it was a perfect, uh, perfect time together. When my wife and I first got married, uh, we lived on 47th Street in New York City in Midtown on, on 9th, 9th Avenue. So it's, we're right smack in the middle. We're two blocks away from Times Square. One of our favorite things to do was, especially on a Sunday, was to, uh, after we come back from Mass, was to uh, buy the New York Times, which is about yay thick, you know, uh, with all the sections on it. And then we would just go to a diner, and we would sit in the diner, and I think they were pretty upset that we were sitting there for hours because we would just be reading the newspaper together and having coffee and having, you know, brunch. And uh, we would um, we would just spend hours at the diner and then we would go to the, you know, go to the Salvation Army thrift shop and spend all day there. So it was, it was you know, we didn't have much money uh, when we lived in New York City. I just started my career in publishing. I was doing okay, but you know, um, she wasn't making much money. So uh, we were, we were, there were times when we lived off of $20 a week and we would sit down and we would actually talk about, okay, how do we make $20 last for the whole week? <laughs> that was quite a challenge, but you know, we managed. And when you go through difficult moments like that, um, financial hardships like that, it actually brings you together closer because you make plans and, well, okay, how do we make the $20 last? Okay, we were gonna go and eat pasta and, and Vienna sausages all week, you know? So things like that, it just, it does bring you together, you plan together. It, you don't have a choice but to lean on each other. And that's what Ray and I did was really, we leaned on each other a lot in New York City. We enjoyed being there, we enjoyed being poor there. Uh, but at the same time, we knew that you know, it, things will change at some point. And I knew that because I was working hard with my career, you know, furthering my career in publishing. My wife's death was, was unexpected. I, I wasn't expecting it to happen. Um, and and the, the fact that it was unexpected makes it, to me, sudden, because I wasn't expecting it. But um, she... Um, She was taking a lot of medications uh, for uh, the illness that she had. And 
over the years that she was taking the uh, medications, I saw her personality change gradually. And, and I knew that it had something to do with the medications because the medications were quite strong. Uh, because I know they were quite strong because when her doctors would change the dosage of the medications, it would affect her personality uh, significantly until they were able to determine a dosage that would stabilize her. But having taken those medications for her illness for so such a long period of time, it resulted in other side effects, um, which affected her greatly. And I don't have any evidence of it, but I believe that those medications contributed to her uh, sudden death because her death, the cause of her death was uh, cardiac arrest. She went into cardiac arrest in 2016 and I didn't do any autopsy. There was no point in doing an autopsy when she died. She died and I was more concerned with her soul, not her body at that point. Um, the hope was for us to <laughs> grow old together, really old together. Uh, and, um, but in retrospect, you know, whenever I think about the fact that she died, I look at it from the point of view of divine providence. Uh, and when I say that, it's because of where I am now, because of where her death led me to. To me, that was part of, of God's plan um, I'm not saying that God killed her so that I could become a priest. No, of course not. But I think her death is what will make me, I think, the priest that God wanted me to be when I was 15 years old and 16 years old, which I don't think I would have been because I remember the way I thought, the way I reasoned back then. Uh, and the way I viewed priesthood back then. And I, I know that her death would make me the priest that God wanted me to be. And the fact that she was in my life is something that would, that, that makes me, that makes me the person that, that, that I don't think I would have turned out to be. I know myself. <laughs> um, after she died, it wasn't, let's just say, it wasn't a very virtuous life. Uh, we, I had, you know, I kind of fell away from the church a little bit, and it wasn't a very virtuous life. And her death was like um, a recalibration of my compass. And every time that compass starts to kind of swerve away, Ray becomes the recalibration for me of that compass saying, okay, you need to come back to God because it's very clear in your mind now where God wants you to be, what he calls you to be, and what he wants you to become. And so Ray is now everything that recalibrates, recalibrates me. Of course, it's God that does everything for me, but Ray is now an instrument for making sure that I end up where I'm supposed to be. Yeah, the day when she died, when my wife, when Ray died, um, I was actually away in California because my mom had an operation. So in, in that sense, I was, it was devastating to know that she, it was my sister-in-law who found my sister and who contacted me saying that she went into cardiac arrest. And um, of course, the first thing that went through my mind was, I, I was numb when she died. I think um, it was like, Processing that information was difficult. Um, and those weeks after she died was just, 
you were just numb. Uh, you were, everything was a blur. In fact, when I, whenever I think back at it, there are some things that I regret having done after she died. Like, and I suggest, I always suggest this to people who have a loved one that just died, is that don't, don't throw away anything they have. Don't get rid of anything they have. Put them all in the box, seal it, put them away for a year, and then open it a year later, and then take a look at it and say, okay, this one has to go, that one has to go. Don't ever make that decision right after your loved one dies. Because um, I always tell one of the things that she has that I, and I'm glad I have, is uh, her hairbrush. People always say, oh, why her hairbrush? Because it has her hair and her dandruff. <laughs> Where else am I gonna get that, you know? Uh, so, yeah, just my advice, don't throw anything away after your loved one dies. Put them away, keep them sealed in the box, and then come back later and make your decisions later. But yeah, it was difficult when she died, because especially sifting through her things, and that's one of the, probably one of the most difficult things anybody will ever go through after someone they love dies, is just sifting through their belongings. But even sifting through her belongings uh, was, uh, was a moment of reflection. Um, wherein you realize that everything you own in this life means nothing, absolutely nothing. My wife uh, owned this teddy bear that she's had since she was a little girl, and it lived with us in New York City. And then when I, oh, and I got a job, I worked in Switzerland for the United Nations for 10 years. And um, in Switzerland, she had that teddy bear with her, and I swear, if I had lost that teddy bear, she would have disowned me and left me, probably. Um, but the day she died, that was one of the things that was on the bed was her teddy bear, and I'm going, she never would have parted with that teddy bear, except now. Now that teddy bear is here and she's gone, and I'm going, that's because everything that we hold precious in this life, every possession that we have in this life that we feel is so precious means absolutely nothing. There's only one thing that matters, and that is your relationship with God. You know, people always say, oh, life is short, best live it. You know, eternity is long, best prepare for it. And her death made that very poignant to me, that, you know, eternity is long and that I should be preparing for it because I'd like to see her in that eternity. Um, and I know that her death is, helps prepare me for that and the fact that I am going to become a priest and that God allowed me to become a priest is it's not a guarantee. It certainly gives me a clearer vision of how I should live my life. After, after Ray died, I didn't really think of the seminary. It was like the furthest thing in my mind. Um, but after she died, of course, you go through a period of mourning. And, and um, I was going to uh, my, I found myself going to, to pray for her at my, uh, at my pa home parish, uh, Christ the King in Des Moines. And um, one of the permanent deacons that uh, was there told me like, hey, why don't you become a permanent deacon? And I said, oh, oh yeah, that, that would, that's, that, that, what a great idea to become a permanent deacon. And then I was reflecting on it and I'm going, wait, Ray has, Ray died. Permanent deacon, well, why, why not go all the way? Um, and so that was really the very first time that deacon inviting me to become a permanent deacon was the very first time if I was going to look for a trigger that kind of got, that turned up the volume of my vocation back up from when it was and when I was younger, when I, when I discerned out. It was that invitation. I think that was the moment when God said, 
Hey. I want you to I want you to come back. I need you to come back. And as crazy as it was, you know, because at the time I was thinking the retirement by a boat, that was the plan that we had. My wife and I had a plan to buy a little boat and retire to the Philippines and just sail from one little tropical island to the other and live in boat and maybe have a pied de somewhere and uh, there's a storm beyond land. But that was the plan and that was still the plan after she died. It was such a, an attractive plan, but after the volume went up on, you know, on, on the vocation, it was almost like, it was almost like uh, God got, you know, Jesus got on board my boat and said, oh, didn't you get the memo? <laughs> this is now a, uh, a fishing boat and no longer a pleasure craft. Uh, so gradually the, the, sh the sheen of that plan to have a, um, to buy a boat and retire somewhere in the Philippines going from island to island, as attractive as that was, it gradually lost its luster. And, uh, and that's when I decided to uh, approach the vocation director in Des Moines, uh, Father Ross Parker, uh, who uh, didn't really know what to make of me. <laughs> I said, well, I'll speak to the bishop about it. Um, and he did. And uh, I remember meeting the bishop for the first time, and he said, and after he had made his decision, and he said, uh, it was Bishop Pates of, uh, of, of Des Moines at the time, and he said, well, he's, I, I support you 200% uh, on one condition, he says. I said, oh, 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 what's the condition? He said, well, you can't retire at 70. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I thought it was funny because I wasn't even thinking of retiring at that point. And I, actually, I did tell him that I said, you know, if I was thinking of retirement, I'd stay where I am. Uh, retirement will be when God retires me. In fact, if he retires me while I'm saying Mass and I just drop dead, I'd be very happy with that while saying Mass. That's when I realized how strong the call is that God was trying to make, that if I can give God 25 years, I will give him a solid 25 years of my life. I think her, the depth of her faith is something that I will bring with me into my ministry. After she died, one of the things that, like I said uh, before, was one of the difficult things was sifting through her things, and one of those things is her laptop computer. And in her laptop, and I regret not having known this, but she wrote a lot. She wrote a lot of poetry. She wrote a lot of prayers to God that I had no clue she was doing. And some of the prayers that she has, I, you know, I kept, you know, I, after I found them out and I found them in her laptop, I kept with me because the prayers and the writings that she had, um, just her reflections about God. I'm reading it and I'm going, the depth of her, of the, I can only think of it as inspiration from the Holy Spirit because she never went to a theology school. But the, the things that she wrote about, about the Trinity, about, uh, about the Eucharist, about her love for Jesus dying on the cross, it made me realize, it made me regret not having known that part of her during the latter years of her life, that she was writing so much uh, about her love for God. Um, in a way, it made me feel better that she did have those writings, that she did love God that much, and that she did have that relationship with God at that level before she died. Um, that is a comfort for me because that's one of the things that I failed her in, if you were, if I, that's, if we can look at it that way, was that during the latter parts of her life, I think I, I no, I don't think, I know, I failed to accompany her. I mentioned earlier that I had a little bit of a falling off from the church. I, I, you know what, 
reading her writing, she didn't need me. <laughs> I needed her. Uh, and after I found her writings, and after she died, she was there for me when I wasn't there for her in the latter part of her life. Again, I think this is part of, this is part of God's divine providence was for me to find that and to realize and that all had an effect on where I am now. Being able to um, administer the, sac also the seven sacraments is something that I'm really looking forward to. Because, you know, people, people ask me, wouldn't you have wanted to become a dad? Duh, of course. Um, but now you, you're going to become a priest. You know, how are you supposed to become a dad now? Well, I'm going to become a father to everybody in my parish. That's one thing. But that, what, the, what does that mean in real terms? You know, how, how could you? Because it's always a question of intimacy. Intimacy, sorry. Yeah, I had intimacy with my wife, and that was beautiful. And when I was at the uh, Institute for Priestly uh, Formation, that was one of the things that we talked about was intimacy. And, and when we talk about intimacy, most seminarians kind of gravitate toward sexual intimacy. And, and I remember sharing that, you know, the sexual intimacy in, in, in your relationship with your spouse, it is actually the last thing that you will think about after they, when they, when they die, when, in my case, when my spouse died. It's the last thing that actually I think about in terms of my int intimacy with her. The thing that was most intimate for me when it comes to my wife was trying to figure out how we're gonna make $20 last for the next week. That was, to me, that was intimacy. Uh, um, being able to share how she felt when she was ill and she wasn't doing too well, that was intimacy for me. The last thing that you would ever think about is sexual intimacy. Yeah, that was int intimacy, yes, absolutely. But it's not, it's the least memorable of every intimacy that you will ever share with your spouse. When I think about intimacy with my parishioners, as a priest, and I think about a parishioner who's a penitent who will come to me in confession, who will spill her life, uh, his or her life to me, asking God's forgiveness to be absolved of that sin. Can you think of anything more intimate than being able to offer that absolution from God to your parishioner? Can you think of a uh, intimacy, you know, more intimacy than, than being able to accompany them in their journey to become, you know, a Catholic. You know, I, I can't think of anything more intimate than being able to be there as a father to my parishioners. Just like when I think about my wife, it's not about sexual intimacy. It was about the little things that we shared together that was much more intimate. And as a father to my parishioners, it's being able to offer uh, 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 the sacraments. I can't think of anything more intimate than being able to be there to marry uh, a couple uh, in my parish and to put them together and that, to offer them that, that promise to each other, binding them and becoming one. That, to me, that's intimacy. Confession is intimacy. Uh, being able to absolve them of their sin, that's intimacy. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, that's something that I really am looking forward to as a priest is to be able to offer that uh, to, my, to be a father to my parishioners. And I think that is the fatherhood that God is giving me now because I did not become a father as uh, married to my to, to Ray. What I remember most about Ray, what I appreciate most about Ray is how much she fell in love with God, how much she fell in love with the Eucharist as a Catholic. And I didn't even see it, it was right under my nose. And so, and for that, I'm grateful. And for that, I will always, you know, remember her because this is why I wanted to become a priest, is to be able to 
offer the Eucharist uh, as for her. As a priest, after I'm old and decrepit 25 years from now, I think the thing that I would like people to remember most about me as a priest is how much I learned to, how much, how much I was there to accompany them in their difficult moments. I think the uh, whole notion of being, of accompaniment is something that's extremely important that the priest should be able to offer to their parishioners as the father to them, is to be able to be there for them. Um, I wish I had been there in that respect from, for Ray. Um, in, in near the end of her life. And because of that experience, I want to be, I will do that for my parishioners to be able to be there and accompany them in their most difficult moments, but also in their most joyous moments. And that hopefully they'll remember that of me when, uh, when I die. This is the priest that he was to us.